Hello. <laughs> uh, that's good. Um, I always get a little nervous, so just bear with me for like two minutes because it'll calm down <laughs> after that. But I was thinking about how many times I've stood up here and talked, and then I was thinking about like <laughs> four years ago, we had like a little Door of Life talent show which was really, really fun. And I decided for the first time ever to try to sing in front of people, which I don't sing. And I sang a song about um, being in love with this boy at Blue Horse as a total funny thing. And then I ended up marrying a boy from Blue Horse. So it's just kind of funny. The Lord knew things before I did. <laughs> ah, that's a good time. Okay, that's good. Um, okay, so I... Carla asked me to speak here months and months and months ago, and I was supposed to speak in January, but couldn't, so Julie did. Great, we flip-flopped. Um, and I don't know, I feel like it's kind of a random put-togetherness, a little bit of my story, but a lot of what God has done in my heart, mostly, since I've been in Door County. And like Carla said, she's been with me since the beginning. A lot of you have. So it's really a treat to get to talk here and just share a little bit about what God, um, yeah, just the journey he's had me on. So I want to pray because it's going to calm me down. <laughs> and then let's, let's go. Heavenly Father, God, um, uh, I just, I'm so grateful because um, sometimes just being able to speak things out loud for me just helps to press things deeper into my heart. And so I pray the same for each of these women that, God, the words that you would have me speak, that you would just highlight what you want to highlight um, and just help me to get the words out in a way that glorifies you and brings honor to your name. But God, just take these words by your spirit and press them into the hearts of each of the women here. Um, God, I trust you. I, I love you so much. We all love you so much. And um, yeah, just be here with us as we speak and listen and um, just worship you. And thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So identity, it's kind of vague, but I guess the, that's the point I'm going to want to keep coming back to. <laughs> so if I lose my focus, there it is, identity. We are children of God, and, um, you know, it's so simple, and it's something that we say a lot, but I really want to kind of hone in on, like, the details of that, and, you know, when I think about identity, like, if, if you don't know the Lord, there's a lot of ways that you can want to try to identify yourself with, but then even within the church, as followers of God, it's really easy to try to, like, grab hold of some of these labels, and they can be good things, they can be bad things, and so I was just kind of thinking, like, sometimes even in a negative way, we can start labeling ourselves, like, by past sins or hard things we've had happen in our lives or hardships, you know, and they are good, and they are powerful testimonies of God bringing us out of there, but also God doesn't want to keep us in that pit, you know, um, he wants to carry us out. And then there can be positive things we want to label ourselves with, like victories God's, God's taken us on, like, let's say, 20 years ago, and you keep going back to that one time where God did this in my life, and it's like, well, actually, he wants to keep doing stuff in your life. And so, like, keep looking for these good things God's doing. Um, we can try to label ourselves by the family we have, um, like for me, it's kind of interesting because since I've been married, so my, my new last name is Gomez, but I was a Melezva, and in Luxembourg at least, Melezva carries a lot of weight because my uncle was a judge, and like, so I felt like if I got pulled over and people saw my license and they saw Melezva, they were like, oh, is Dennis your uncle? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> can I not have a ticket, please? <laughs> and there's just like, Melezva is like a very large name, so it's kind of funny because like, I realize now, like, oh, my license says Gomez, and I don't have that anymore. So it's just, I don't know, it's kind of a silly thing. Um, and then you can also try to label yourselves by your career and just the accomplishments you've made and the successes you've had in life. And those are all good things. They're not bad things. But the struggle can be 
when we forget that our number one identity is in that we are children of God. Um, so there's one story. I have a clicker. Hold. Um, one story I thought of uh, that just kind of came to mind, identity. Um, someone in the Bible that had great hardship was the man who was paralyzed by the pool of Bethesda. And I'm just going to read it out loud from that screen. Inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. And one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. So that's a long time. I mean, that's like, I don't know how old he was, but that's got to be the majority of his life. So there's like identity. He's that sick guy by the pool that lays there and tries to get in the pool every time it bubbles up. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? And again, that seems like a silly question because of course he would. But again, like if you think of that mindset, and I don't know where this guy's head was, but you know, I'm just thinking about myself. Like sometimes when something really hard has happened, it is hard to get yourself out of that mindset and think something could change. And maybe even it's sometimes in a weird twisted way, it can be like comforting to wallow in that pit because it's like you have that victim mentality of like, well, this is just my life and nothing good can come out of this. So Jesus outright asked him, do you want to get well? And he says, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. And Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. New identity, right? Okay. And so this is a huge victory. This is a huge, awesome plus um, in his life. And I just think, like, sometimes that's what Jesus wants us to do. Like, I'm not saying that it always looks like this, but just changing your mindset even that, like, things can change. So that's kind of the direction we're going to go in. And to start, I just want to share a little bit of my story and just kind of how God's taken me to come to this realization because it's taken a while. Um, so I've been walking with the Lord since I was about 18, meaning like I grew up with my dad sharing Bible stories with us and praying with me and my brother. But when I went to college, it was like the first time in my life where I had to start making my own decisions to seek the Lord on my own. Um, and I did that, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but as a young 18-year-old, <laughs> or like through those college years, you are going to this church, right? And there's something about church women that love to see this young kid who's following the Lord. So my identity started to even get wrapped up in like this people-pleasing, like, yeah, I go to Bible study, and I... I'm at church every Sunday, and there was something in me that liked the fact that these people in my church were commending the fact that I was doing these good things, and I wasn't getting pulled into drinking and boys and sex and all this stuff. I'm not saying my relationship with the Lord wasn't legitimate, but it was so intermingled with this people-pleasing that it was sometimes hard to differentiate, like, am I going to this Bible study because I am afraid of people thinking that I'm falling away from the Lord if I'm not there? Or am I going because I really want to seek the Lord on my own? Um, kind of from there, I started going on mission trips. I started working in Alabama with a ministry that would build sports centers um, in third world environments. And took my first mission trip to Kenya when I was like 19. Loved it life-changing, as you can imagine, any time it would be to go see a different part of the world and these poverty-stricken areas. Um, and that was like my motivation from that point on. I was in college to be a teacher, and I was like, I'm going to teach in Africa, and I'm going to help all these poor areas and these poor people, and I'm going to reach the unreached people groups around the world that I've never heard the gospel. And I was like, this is what I'm doing. And Again, a lot of commendation from people in church that were like, she's doing great things. 
like she's going to go and do all these amazing things in Africa. Again, the desire was there, but it was so intermingled with the fact that people really said, good job, Steph, <laughs> when I was doing that stuff. Um, and it was great. Um, and I did end up going to Chad, Africa, and teaching over there for a year and a half in 2015, and it was wonderful. Um, but along, so I had this strong desire to be a missionary. Along that line, I also really wanted to get married, <laughs> as a lot of 20-something-year-old women do. And, um, you know, with that, you kind of get a lot of... Um, I don't know how to say it. it. It almost became like a victim mentality for me because, you know, you, early 20s, okay, you'll probably meet someone. And then you get into your mid to late 20s and, you know, it just doesn't feel like it's going to happen. And I would get a lot of sympathy or I don't even know how to explain it, but people would be like, oh, you're just, you know, good for you for holding strong and having these high standards and um, being the strong, single Christian woman, like, that's great. Okay, so I go to Chad, strong, single Christian woman, teaching in Africa, it's great. Um, end up meeting a guy there. <laughs> so all of a sudden, like, these two dreams seem to intersect, and all these great ideas I had, and dreams I had, and prayers I had to the Lord were coming together, and it was amazing. Um, and, and it really was. He was over there um, church planting in a village, and I was teaching, and we got together, and we really thought we were going to get married, <laughs> and it was wonderful until we broke up, <laughs> and then I was devastated, and crushed me so hard, and that's when it felt like all of these labels I had just didn't matter, because it was like the first time my heart really hurt, so I come back to the States, and that's what led me to Door County, because it was like 2017. I had no idea what to do. In my mind, God's plan for my life had just crumbled, and I didn't know what was going to happen. So I came to Door County just to work a summer job and um, met Carla came to Door of Life, met everyone here, and the Lord just started doing some incredible things in my heart, which is so funny because it was at the point when all of these different things that seemed like big accomplishments and big things that the Lord was going to do to me, do in me, do with me, um, just fell apart. And that's when God was like, okay, Steph, now we can, <laughs> now we can really start doing some work in you. And um, so... I feel like I had a lot of questions about the Holy Spirit. I just had a lot of questions. I feel like my walls were coming down about... It, I wouldn't necessarily say I had like this huge religious mindset, but I did a little bit. There was a lot of legalism tied up in my heart. And it was like all of that had to come down. And I knew who Jesus was. I knew the Bible. But... It was like God was helping me to read it and understand it in a new way that I had never had before. Um, so I, I just feel like God likes to get us out of our box and because then he can really speak and we don't have all these preconceived notions about what, how he's going to work and who he is. Um, so I come here. And it was a really humbling experience because I was working front desk at Rowley's Bay Resort. <laughs> and I felt like I needed to tell everyone, like, yeah, I'm working front desk, but, like, I was a missionary and I was a teacher and I had this great boyfriend. <laughs> but, but none of that exists anymore. And people didn't necessarily care. <laughs> Shocking. Um, you know, some people would listen about my experience in Africa or whatever, but it's really hard to relate to that when you've never been there. And, you know, I just wanted to tell everyone because I felt like this is important and you should know this about me. And they just wanted to check into their room. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> gosh, the patience people had with me. Okay. Um, so anyway, I, you know, so I do that 
until October of 2017. And the reality is God was just doing so much in my heart here at Door of Life and with the people I was meeting here that I just was like, Lord, I have no idea career-wise what I'm doing, relationship-wise what I'm doing, where I'm going to live. But what I do know is that you're really doing some cool things in me here, and so I'm just going to follow that. And so the Lord just kept opening up doors for me to um, have a place to live, have a new job. I've started working at Blue Horse, where I have now been for over six years. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. Um, but again, just this humbling thing where he stripped me of all these labels. And like, I love my job, but anybody can really make coffee and take orders. So it's not like it's this great achievement, but it's been a really good place that God just is teaching me, like, it's not about the things you do, Steph. It's really not. It's about this relationship. Um, so coming back to the idea that we are children of God, I just want to kind of, um, oh, first, before that, this is like a little hiccup in the middle, <laughs> because the, I, the cool thing is, is that the theme of God Encounters is Song of Songs, which Dee and Carla both know this so well, but Song of Songs was God's kind of love letter to me that wooed me back um, to understand his love so much more when I moved back to Door County. Um, but in Song of Songs, it's this beautiful, kind of erotic <laughs> book of the Bible that talks about the love between a man and a woman, but um, kind of a lot through D. D wrote a book and had a Bible study that started literally when I moved to Door County um, that talked about how, like, yes, that book is about the love between a man and a woman, but it's a metaphor really for God's love for us as his bride. And we know, like, throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament, there's so many references of God calling us his bride. Um, so Isaiah 54 um, talks about, For your creator will be your husband. The Lord of heaven's armies is his name. He is your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of all the earth. And then later in Ephesians, when Paul is talking about marriage, he's like really honing in on the fact that this is about Christ and the church. He says, As the scriptures say, A man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. And so I love when God, like you think about earthly relationships, like actually it's so funny because moments I've been in love, I'm like, God, why do you let us fall in love? Like, couldn't we just be robots and like emotions aren't there because it just feels like too risky to let us love people. <laughs> like everyone gets hurt, it seems like. Um, but it's like, what a cool thing that God trusts and trusts to us, that we have this ability to choose who we love, to, to like feel the strength of love, so that when God tells us, I love you, we have things to hook that onto, to be like, oh, like, my dad loves me, or like, my mom loves me, or my husband loves me, or I love my kids, or however that looks in relationships in your life. Um, I just... I just love it. So, and I just got married in August, so I'm kind of on a high of love, love, love. So, <laughs> um, but you know, it's just, it's a cool thing to think about the fact that God calls it a husband and a wife type of love because that is, I, I think, the only type of love that's totally exclusive, like one to one, one person to one person. Unless if you're in Chad, because they have multiple wives, but <laughs> for our sake, <laughs> one to one. Okay, um, so that's just a cool um, little side note. But now we are children of God, so we're going to talk about that love. Um, not that one yet. So, children. Okay, I've announced this now, but I am 15 weeks pregnant. Woo! Very exciting. Um, but it sheds new light on children being a child of God. So again... Here's another relationship where God gives us this ability to have kids. I have not fully experienced like holding a, like my baby yet, but even having one growing in me, there's like this powerful love that you start thinking about so many things. And um, gosh, the other day I was looking up 
Like, I'm like, what if our kid wants to go to college? Well, we should start saving up for that. So I'm like looking up college savings accounts and like, what if they don't want to go to college? I don't want to put that pressure on them. So like, you know, I just start, you start thinking about this stuff and, you know, I'm like, God is thinking about that stuff for us too. Like, um... Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So he thinks about us so much in the way, you know, and it's so small, but in the way that I'm thinking about this baby, he thinks about us even more. Like Psalm 139 is incredible, and it just goes on and on about he has so many thoughts for us, you can't even count them. And he has all these days outlined for us. And he saw us when we were being knit together in our mother's womb. And it's just incredible to think about that. And, you know, the fact that the God of the universe would care that much about us. Um, man, I wish I had, I, there's like verses just flying through my head. But there's a, a passage in the Old Testament in one of the minor prophets that talks about how like God's heart is like yearning for his child that's run away from him, referring to like Israel or Ephraim, I think, where he's like just yearning. And again, like I've not fully experienced the love as a mother, but like I know my mom, <laughs> she would like, I know she would take a bullet for me, like no question, you know? And that's God, like he, he, his love is solid. His love is, um, you know, it doesn't fluctuate based on our performance. Um, but he feels that pull that we would feel for our kids, for our spouse, for whatever these earthly relationships that we have are. Um, I think I do have a Psalm 139. Yeah, Psalm 139, 16 says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. I mean, that's just incredible, right? I mean, you can sit. I've sat in Psalm 139 and just meditated on it. And just like, it's just incredible to think about that. And there's so many people in the world and God's thinking about them all. Um, and then the idea of being a mother, like my husband and I have talked about just the things that are important to us as parents, and we're talking about parenting. And the biggest thing I would say that we both keep saying back and forth is that um, we really want our kid to feel like they can tell us anything, that we would never want them to be afraid to come to us, to approach any topic with us. And that's just kind of a big focus. And again, that I'm thinking about God and... Um, that's what prayer is, right? And sometimes we can make prayer to be this big thing and we talk about prayer meetings and stuff, but man, sometimes my best prayer times are when I'm driving to work and I'm just talking to God in my car, you know, and just laying it out before him. And I think like sometimes it's hard to bring things to the Lord if, if um, and again, we know he knows everything. He knows all the thoughts in our heads. He sees everything, but there's something powerful about saying it out loud to him um, and almost like confessing it. And so many times there's like a worry that's just swir swirling around in my head. And it's like God will tap me on the shoulder and be like, but Steph, did you talk to me about that yet? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and then I just tell him about it. And it's not this, you know, it's not these great powerful words that I'm saying. It's just asking him to come close and to fix something or you know, change something or, or just just saying it to him what's worrying me. Um, and so I think, um, actually, just one verse on that. First Peter 5, 7, it can't get much simpler than that. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Um, and that's just God being a good father and saying, I want you to tell me these things. Um, and I think, like, you know, I'm so grateful because I have a really good dad who has always... Um, just wanted me to come to him with things. And I used to think about this picture kind of talking about my relationship with God. Like, if I, and I've shared this before, but 
like I don't live with my dad anymore. But when I when I go to his house, I don't knock on the front door. I just walk right in. And if I'm hungry, I just go right up to the fridge and I just grab a snack or a glass of water or whatever I want. He's always got candy on the counter. So I'm eating gummy worms and just like the little kid I am. And um, that brings, that really makes him happy that I do that. And in comparison, if I like walked up to the, to his house and I was like, knocking on the door, and I waited for him to come answer, and I timidly walked in, and I was like, Dad, I just, I don't want to bother you, but I'm a little hungry. Do you think I could just have, like, a cracker and maybe a little sip of water because I'm a little thirsty? He'd be like, Steph, help yourself to whatever you want. You know, he'd be almost like, why are you, like, almost offended. Like, do you think I'm a mean person that I wouldn't want my daughter to help herself to whatever I have? But I think sometimes that's how we can approach God is like we don't want to ask too much or we don't, we're almost like afraid to come to him. But I'm like, man, again, God gives us these earthly relationships to help us understand his love for us better. So in the same way that my dad would be offended if I was knocking on the door and cautiously asking for things, God is, you know, in my mind, I'm like, he's the same. Like he... He doesn't want us, because, it, because what that does is it really shows what we believe about God, what we believe about his character. Again, gosh, I should have put more down, but there's that um, parable that talks about the servants with the master. I'm going to mess this up because I don't have it on the PowerPoint. <laughs> but essentially, um, there were ser- um, the master gives servants different um, amounts of money to to keep, to keep while he goes on vacation. And two of the servants invest it, and it, the, the amount multiplies. But one of them just buries it in the ground. And when the master asked why he buried it, he was like, well, because I thought you to be a rude ma- or a mean master, and I didn't want you to get mad. And he punishes him because it shows, like, again, that's a parable. It's not perfect. But there's something to be said about the way that we interact with the Lord shows what we actually believe about him and his character. So if we believe that God is good and he cares about us and he loves us, um, it's going to show in how we pray and how we approach him and how we talk about him with people. Um, So, you know, there's that. Okay. And Matthew also has just a very blatant comparison to parents, to children, to God, to us. It says, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you, sinful people, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? So again, this is just the Father's heart for us. Um, You know, you can go on and on with the different things that being a child of God can mean, but... um, I just think, you know, I just think it's really cool how God um, gives us these examples. And then he really hones it in in scripture to really make it solid. So you don't just imagine these things. It's like God's like, no, this is true. I want you to experience it here on earth, but I want you to experience it with me. Experience it with me on a spiritual level as well. And then just being open to what God's going to do and how he's gonna, th- there was a song we sang that said, um, break down the walls of all my religion, your way is better. It really is. And, you know, even thinking back to my story, like, when I was 20, I wouldn't have said I was tied up in religion. I was talking about how our relationship with God is not about religion, but it's really easy to let those walls kind of build up in your mind. Um, and then it is, it's like God comes in, he breaks in, and he just crumbles it all away to teach us that it really is about a relationship, and it's about talking to him and loving him and letting him correct us and discipline us, as all good parents do, um, and and reshape things in us for his glory, for our good, to show us what love is, and it's great. So that's about all I have. (laughs) But... um, Yeah.